your Bibles and turn with me to the epistle of, of the book of Ephesians. And I'm going to ask you to stand with me just for one more moment in, in honor to the word of the Lord. I want to read the first two, two verses to you. Our text really goes all the, the way down to the end of verse number six. But I want to start off by way of introduction with the first two verses. And it says this to us. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I like this, by the will of God. He stuck that on there so that there's no doubt about it, his credentials. He wasn't voted into this, this office by people. As a matter of fact, when Saul was converted by Christ, the church wasn't very happy about receiving him. Remember that. But boy, when God calls you to do something and God ordains you to do that, boy, and he's kind of boasting in that, uh, the fact that the, this is, I'm in the will of, of God. And there's no better place to be. Apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and, and faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Ah, oh, to the saints. Think about that. You may be seated, by the way. Oh, yeah. You, I noticed you were kind of in limbo. Up, down, do we go down? Yeah, go, go on down. Okay, to the saints. Uh, let that kind of settle in on you. I mean, what a strange way to address his audience here, don't you, you think? I, I mean, aren't saints usually dead people? I think they are, who have achieved super spiritual status during their lives, and, and they've simply earned this title, this, this label. Uh, you know, the word saint in the New Testament has certainly been abused and misused and misunderstood. Even the dictionary defines a saint as, listen, a person officially recognized for holiness of life. Hmm. That kind of makes you wonder. I mean, who is it exactly that makes this official recognition? Who is it? That, that they, they sit there and they, they judge or they grade the, the individual and they determine that, yeah, yeah, they're, they're a saint. Uh, if you check church history, it usually is some religious group who decides who should or, or shouldn't be canonized. Living here, we've all been done canonized. I'll take that out later. Uh, but how does, it, how, does it, how does it work? Well, the deceased person's life is examined very closely, carefully, to see whether or not they're qualified uh, for sainthood. If the candidate's character and his conduct are found to be, I mean, above reproach, if they've been responsible for working at least, catch this, two miracles, then they are qualified uh, to be made a saint. Remember that. One miracle won't, won't earn you a marble statue with your name on it. Okay, so if you want to be a saint, you've got to do, write that down, because it's important. You've got to do two miracles. <laughs> I find that kind of comical. <laughs> it's funny. My mama, you remember, uh, always wanted to write a book, the title being Called to Be Saints. If she said that one time to me, she said it a billion times. She never got further than the title, but she did come up with the title. And yet here, these folks are being called saints already, already. And catch this, they're not even dead. And better yet, it's not recorded that they had performed any miracles, though they had experienced the greatest miracle, the miracle of God's amazing saving grace. Yeah. To the saints, to the saints. The word saint is simply used to describe one who has trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. The word saint means one who has been set apart. It, it's related to the word sanctified, which, which means set apart. When a sinner accepts Jesus Christ as his or her personal Savior. He is taken out of the world, and he is placed in Christ. Even though they're still in the world, hey, they're not of it. Listen, if you're in Christ, look at your neighbor. You're a saint. So you might want to start referring to the person sitting beside you, if they know God, as saint. If you're not in Christ, you're an ain't. So bottom line is saint or ain't, uh, which one 
are you? And I think that's a question that everybody in the world one day has to kind of wrestle with. Hmm, do I know him or are Don't I know him? How did these folks at Ephesus become saints? The answer is found in those first two verses that we've read. Two words, faithful and grace. Paul addressed his letter to the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. These people, understand, weren't saved by living faithful lives. Rather, they put their faith in Christ and were saved. And there's a difference. But God, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we, watch, were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive. Paul went on to say grace to you. Grace. The word grace is used 12 times in this letter, and it refers to the kindness of God towards undeserving people. For by grace... You have been saved through faith, and not not even of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It takes God and the gift of God's grace for you to ever get to God and find God. What a God, what a God. Grace and faith, uh, they go together like a hand in a glove because the only way to experience grace and salvation is is through faith. You've got to believe. You've got to accept. Vance Havner said in referring to saints, God preserves the saints, but he doesn't pickle them. I read that. I kind of liked it. And here's one more by Vance. I'm calling him Vance as if I know him. I really don't. Uh, We are long on membership, but short on discipleship. We are more anxious to gather statistics than to grow saints. Something to ponder. Okay, let's hit the gas, move on down the road, and let's look at our primary text. Verses 3, 2, and we'll be nailing all the way down to verse number 6 this morning. In the Greek, this, these, these verses comprise one sentence. They, they encompass the past, the present, the future of God's eternal purpose for his church. It's Paul's outline of God's master plan for salvation. Someone has said, I'm sure you've heard, history is simply the outworking of his story, which has already been planned, and it has been pre-written in in eternity. This passage can also be divided into three sections, each of which focuses on a different person of the Trinity. Verses 3 to 6. 6a, centers on the Father. Verses 6b to 12, uh, center on the Son. And verses 13 and 14, they center on the Holy Spirit. And we'll be looking at this. We'll be going verse by verse. So here it is. The Father plans, the Son executes, and then the Holy Spirit comes along and he implements and, and he applies those, those principles in daily practice uh, in the life of a Christian. In this long sentence, Paul names just a few of the blessings that make up our spiritual wealth or our riches. And I want us to look this morning. I thought I could do this whole thing. I thought I, got, I nailed all three of the aspects of, of the, the Trinity here and, and the part that they play in, in, in God's salvation plan. But we're only going to get to the Father today. Is that okay? Okay, here we go. Okay, let's look at God the Father. First of all, verse number three says, he has blessed us. He has blessed us. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. He didn't leave anything uncovered, didn't leave anything out. The Christian life is centered in heaven. His citizenship is in heaven. His name is written in heaven. His father is in heaven. His attention, his affection ought to be centered on the things of of heaven. We're to set our minds on things above, not on things of the earth. Jesus said, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither rust nor destroys nor moth and where thieves do not break in and steal. Being in Christ is to be in the riches of God. Think of it. Think of it. 
He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Not only has he blessed us, he has also chosen us. Yeah, chosen us. Verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Jesus said to his disciples, guys, catch this. You didn't choose me. I chose you. You didn't call me. I called you. Listen, a sinner uh, left to his own ways does not seek God. He doesn't just accidentally one day stumble over a Savior. God, in his love, seeks the sinner. He, he finds the lost. Jesus said that I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Search and rescue mission. That's why, why, why the Lord came down. And aren't you glad that he did? Notice that God chose us even before he created the universe. That's mind boggling so that our salvation is holy of his grace. It has nothing to do with our works. It has everything to do with his finished work on the cross. That's why it was a joy to celebrate communion today. Because that's where our salvation is all wrapped up. That's where we find our security in God. Good day, bad day. I, I did pretty good serving the Lord today. Did pretty bad. Yeah, it doesn't matter. You belong to God. You belong to him. And you know what? On your worst day, if you stumble and you fall and you fail, God doesn't love you any less. You can never do anything in your life that will cause your heavenly father to give up on you or to turn his back on you because he loves you. I mean, the very essence of God is that God is love. He's not going to walk away from you like people do. You have to be walk on eggshells in front of some people. You, you have to be at the peak of your performance. You have to do everything just right or some people just write you off. God won't do that to you. He chose you. He chose you before the creation of the universe. He chose us in Christ, not in ourselves. And he chose us, watch, for a divine purpose, to be holy and without blame. <laughs> without blame. What a profound thought. Think about that for a moment. In Christ. Wow, wait a minute. You might be tempted to say, well, hey, I'm not so bad. Well, think again. You're not bad at all. In Christ, you're blameless. If I'm reading my Bible right, hey, his grace covers your faults and your guilt. In Christ, our lives hidden in him and his life is hidden in the Father. Man, you talk about security. You talk about a foundation upon which you can build your future, knowing that God will never walk away from you, never leave you, never forsake you, abandon you. He'll always be there. He chose us in him. Well, does that mean that the sinner responds to God's grace against his own will? Absolutely not. The mystery of divine sovereignty and human responsibility probably will never be solved in this life or on this side of heaven. Both are taught in the Bible, both are true, and both are essential. Jesus said, for many, many are called, but few, few chosen. But here's the deal. The decision to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior is up to you, up to the individual. It's an act of our own free will. In other words, we choose to be chosen. Huh? He'll call. The Holy Spirit will woo people, draw people, but it's up to the individual to make a decision. And that's up to each of us. Your mama can't make it for you. Your grandmother can't make it for you. Hey, how many times do we have loved ones that don't know Jesus? And don't you wish you could make the call? Don't you wish you could just decide for them? Yeah, let me go ahead and do that for you. 
Uh, no, it, it's a very individual, and it's based upon free will. God doesn't hold a gun to anybody's head and say, you, you have to serve me, you have to accept me. He leaves that up to us. The Father has blessed us. That's good, right? Don't you feel blessed by God? Amen. He has chosen us. I, I love this one in verse 5. He has adopted us. Adopted us. What began in eternity past before the foundation of the world was fulfilled in time present and will continue for all of eternity. God's master plan, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, adopted us. Predestination refers to what God does for saved people. Nowhere do you, you consider the thought that God predestined people to hell. That, that's not the case at all. The word simply means this, to ordain beforehand, to predetermine, to predetermine. The Father knew, and this can kind of just, man, in eternity past, those who would accept his son and receive him as their savior. He knew. Why? Because he's God. What doesn't God know through his divine foreknowledge? And that makes sense. He knows, he knows all things because he is an all-knowing God. Sometimes, you know, our, our knowledge, to say the least, is a little bit limited. To say the least. <laughs> yeah. David said, you, you formed me, you formed my inward parts, you covered me. In my mama's womb, God knew you before you were born, both physically and spiritually. You were created by God. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God. You wouldn't be here if God hadn't made you. And the same God that created you and made you, he knew you. Long before you ever knelt down and asked Jesus to come into your life, God knew you. He knew all about you. You know, the, the events connected with the crucifixion of Jesus were predestined. Go back and read Acts chapter 4. God has predestined our adoption. We're talking about it here in Ephesians 1 verse 5. And our conformity to Christ in Romans chapter 8. All predestined, as well as our future inheritance. Ephesians 1, you can check that out in verse number 11. We have a great inheritance in God. Right now, right now, I mean, we don't have to wait until we go to heaven. Right now, we can enjoy the riches of God's grace in our lives. But listen, in the future, part of that inheritance is a glorified body. <laughs> Boom. Can you beat that? Huh? Huh? We'll have hair in heaven. We won't have aches and pains in heaven. No sickness, no tears, no weeping. Man, and we'll have a glorified body. Amen. Yeah, boy, oh boy. Man, space travel. We can, we can descend from heaven to his earthly kingdom during the millennium. I don't want to get too involved here. We can, we, remember Jesus' is a glorified body? You can walk through walls. <laughs> I love that. He said, what are we going to do in heaven for eternity? Well, I think the first half of it, I'm just going to walk in and out of walls. <laughs> that's, that's neat. That's a little kid inside of me. A glorified body. A body just like Jesus had after the resurrection. Predestined us to adoption. Adoption is the biblical process by which God establishes a relationship with the person who accepts Christ as Savior. Understand, it was God's goal from the very beginning, and not just from our very beginning, but from the beginning of time. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, he has also predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. God chose to adopt you as his child. Wow. Before the foundation of the world. Why? And this is deep. And you need to write this down. For one reason 
and one reason only, because he wanted to. That's deep right there. God did it because God wanted to do it. That's what Paul meant when he wrote, according to the good pleasure of his will. No one forced him to do it. God wanted you as his child. You know, we've all heard of unwanted pregnancies, but you will never hear about an unwanted adoption. Couples adopt children because they want to have children. Bottom line, God adopted you into his family for the very same reason. He knows you. He knows all about you. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly, but he wanted you just the same. God knows your life. God knows every day that you will live. God is already way out ahead of you. Huh? He knows the very hour that you will take your last breath. God knows. God knows all about you. God knows the failures, the, the flaws, the, the imperfections. And yet he still loves us by his grace. And he does not, through the Holy Spirit, give up on us. When we go off track, and we'll talk about that when we get to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and he, he woos us and he moves us back to the straight and the narrow so that we can stay in step with him and God, living under the shadow of the Almighty. He knows you and he still wants you. How much of our lives do we spend trying to hide ourselves from other people? Have you ever found yourself saying, you know, if they really know, knew me, I mean the real me, we all have kind of a facade, you know what I'm saying, that we can put out there uh, and hide behind, and we want people to always think the best. We want to, you know, put on our Sunday go to meet and clothes, and we know exactly what to say. But, I mean, I don't want people to know the real me, because if they ever knew the real me, they might not accept me or, or like me, you know what I'm saying. But that's not the case with God. He knows the real you, the you that nobody else knows. The, the you that you can't hide from him. And he still loves you. And he still wants you. And he still has chosen you. And he has still adopted you, if you've asked Jesus, into your life. If people on the outside of these walls could ever comprehend how much God cares for them and loves them, They'd be breaking down the doors to get in. They would. Because it's unconditional. It's totally sacrificial. It's all about giving to them from the heart of God. People today are really greatly concerned about, you know, identity, a purpose for life, a sense of worth and value. The only way a person can truly achieve a true sense of worth and meaning and significance is to have a right relationship to their creator. It's the only way. It's hard to suffer from a low self-image or low self-esteem when you know you belong to God and you're part of his family. Come on, who's your daddy? Huh? Huh? Abba Father, creator of all things, for God so loved the world that he will give to us his son. We'll see that next week. Huh? Come on. He loved us so much in Christ that he sent to us the Holy Spirit. He is constantly sending those messages to us about how much he cares, how much he loves, how much he protects us. He is so faithful, even we, we are faithless. God still loves and cares for us. He does not walk away. Oh, you can. You can walk away, but the, the Holy Spirit will come after you, and he'll hound you, and he'll call you, and he'll say, come home, come home. He, he goes after the prodigal. Prodigals, listen, aren't lost to God. He's out looking for them and calling to them. He keeps the light on for them. The Father is watching out the windows of heaven for the prodigals. Because he knows, he knows where they've been. He knows the lifestyle that they've been living. He knows the pig pen that they've landed in and the stench that is all over them of the world. And yet daddy says, boy, come home. Come home. And when daddy sees 
a sinner coming home. He runs to meet them. He runs to meet them. Why? They're a son. Wayward, absolutely prodigal, totally. But they're a son. Go get the best robe. What robe would that have been? That would have been daddy's robe. You smell so bad, son. You've taken my name and you've run it through the muck and the mire of riotous living. You don't even look the same. Your life has been so hard. You have been so abused. You have been so beaten and battered. You smell so bad. Go get the best robe. Go to my closet. Go get a ring that bears my name. Put it back on his finger. He doesn't even have shoes. The world will strip the prodigal. I don't know why we think we can leave daddy's house and find something out there that will satisfy. We can't. You're not going to find anything to compare with a loving heavenly father who has given so much and blessed so much and chosen us so much and adopted us so, so graciously. The world has nothing that can even come close to the eternity that God has prepared for those who love him. If you have a low self-esteem, stop looking on things below, because that's probably why you're low, and start focusing on things above. Lift up your eyes from which cometh your help. Huh? Lift up. Change your perspective. I have a low self-esteem. Why? Because you've stopped looking to God. Why so downcast, oh, my soul? Put your hope back in God and come home, wayward one. Come home, come home, come home. Hmm. Man, I don't know if we can fully comprehend the heart of God towards us. to be part of his family, to belong to him, nothing better. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Well, blessed, chosen, adopted, and one final thought, one more. He has accepted us, verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted in the beloved. How powerful is acceptance? How painful, you know, is rejection. But boy, the power of acceptance can transform a life to be made to feel welcomed and at home, to feel like you belong, to feel like you've been received, to to know that that you're, you're loved. We, we, we can't make ourselves acceptable to God. I, I think sometimes people do that. Constantly striving, working, trying to win the favor of God. If I give more, if I do more, if, if I work harder, you've already won the favor of God at the cross. You won that at the cross in Christ. In Christ alone, I I put my trust. Uh, Thank God for his cross. By his grace, through his sacrifice, he makes us accepted and acceptable to God. We are accepted in in Christ. So so what are some of the blessings of the the, the spiritual riches and wealth that, that we have? Well, God the Father, according to his master plan, set in motion before the creation of the world has blessed us, he's chosen us, he's adopted us, he's accepted us. Not bad. That that should help you kind of get through the day. Huh? Okay. Came in from a little, uh, sorry for yourself. Don't have what your neighbors have. Hey, why do the wicked prosper? You know, David went through that. He looked around, and the wicked seemed to be doing really fine, and he was struggling, you know. And and why? 
We, we focus on things below. Lift up your eyes. Check out your future inheritance. Recognize that no matter what you're going through right now, God is with you and he's going through it with you right now. He will provide. He's Jehovah Jireh. He will keep you. And that's the testimony that we have. Hey, it rains on the just and the unjust. Everybody's going to get wet. The difference is when the storm pa passes, the man who built his house on the rock, his house is still standing. Huh? His house is still standing. So how we build, upon which foundation God is good.